my plan was the original lecture I had was going to use the full time and then with the guest speaker taking up 20 minutes, I didn't really want to start that topic and not finish it up. So I had this uh, decision then yesterday afternoon to just, based on a lot of the discussion I've had in some of the groups about the project, and just to talk about where we are in this course, what we're doing, where we're heading, uh, tensions are running high among some groups, there's a little bit of stress and nerves, feeling uh, pinch of midterms and other projects and other courses, and there's all this issue of time management. So this is standard final year anxiety, right? So we're, we're all going to get through it, so that's not, that's not the problem. The problem is managing the process between now and the end, um, and just feeling comfortable in what we're doing, and that we're on track with learning. But that's that's what, what what we're here for, right? And that's why you're here this morning. So I wanted to just step back and let's take a look at a slide that we had up right in the very first class of this course. Okay, so back in the beginning of September, we had this slide up, and I've shown this even to second years and third years, just to help them see the big picture of what we're doing at university. And that there is a plan. <laughs> Some days you may feel there isn't, but there is a plan. So we, we're comfortable with all these courses, right? You've taken all your, your core courses over here. We're not going to talk about that. But what I do want to talk about is what we call here the design systems. So you've taken 2G, your uh, problem solving and communications course over there. And then very importantly, you took 3G last year, or it was prior to this with Dr. Adams. And you've learned a whole lot of good flow sheeting skills over there in 3G. This course takes that up. And as you, all the groups have very quickly discovered that that's not good enough. That's not going to get you a design that you can build. Okay, so assembling a sequence of blocks in Aspen and getting the flows, the temperatures, the pressures is not even 10% of the work that we need to present. Yes, that's just a very basic level of first go at it. Right? Now we're taking it to 4N in this project. And you're seeing that we need to go take a step further. So let's take a look at what you learned in 3G. You learned that flow sheeting in 3G. I'm not sure if Dr. Adams covers uh, different study of process equipment, but certainly covers flow sheeting and process synthesis. So how do you sequence up or structure a flow sheet and some of the decisions one makes over there? And you may or may not have covered how those physical property cal calculations are done in software. So that's the focus of 3G. Now in 4N, we take that and say, Let's assume we've got that flow sheet, which is why we've all been given the, the Aspen uh, diagram there, fully solved. We basically got the solution to the 3G course project last year. That's that Aspen flow sheet we've been given. And we're going to say, well, we're focusing here on 4N and several things. The, more, the one is the economics of the process. So can we cost out the capital items, the operating costs, utilities, raw materials, selling price for our product, if you're on the end of that flow sheet. That's the first part over there. And then the second part of this course is looking at oper operability. So we've already started to look at the safety section of this course, so the hazard and operability studies we've been focusing on, and the alarms and those control loops for ensuring safety. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to look at all these other topics, operating window flexibility, um, covered a little bit of profitability, but we'll touch back on that again. We'll look at startups and shutdowns, dynamics and control, and Dr. Marlin at the end will actually have a two, three classes on troubleshooting and, and teach you solid troubleshooting method. So that's what the project needs to focus on. Okay, this is not a design course. This is not a heat transfer course. This is not a fluid dynamics course. This is not a thermo course. This is a course where we're focusing on the economics and the operations of the process. So what you'll see and take away from this course is a lot of practical things that you can use in your career. And this is the part I argued right at the beginning of September. You won't see this at other universities in Canada. They'll focus on the economics for sure. Most universities like Waterloo have a full semester course on just economics. Okay, so we compressed that down to six weeks and then freed up seven weeks to focus on something that you won't see elsewhere. And that's unique to us. Back, the troubleshooting was developed by John Woods. These other topics as well, and Dr. Martin has written several textbook chapters on a new textbook he's going to release, and you guys have the preliminary drafts of that chapter. So we're, we're quite fortunate doing that, okay? But what it does mean is it throws people 
they sit here and they're like, oh my goodness, where was I supposed to have learned this stuff? Right? Why do we have these extra control loops? Why do we have these redundant pumps, extra heat exchanges? How do I even know I need these things? Okay, so many of the groups have come to me and started asking me questions along those lines. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a deep breath and figure out how we can take and solve this, right? This is something we have to do and, and we will have to do in the future. Now, once you finish up here in 4N, you'll start back in January then with your 4W course. And you'll take uh, the class, will split into three groups, and each of the three groups in your class will look at um, different uh, different areas, so wastewater, polymers, and the <coughs> system stream. You'll look at, at taking a project and they're doing some design. So you'll actually get in-depth in the design and the calculations. For this course, we're stepping back a little bit from that. That's not our focus. But what you will do in 4W is you'll apply that economic evaluation you've learned here in 4M over 4W. So the instructors from 4W always feed back information to me and tell me uh, what, how that went so we know for next year what to change. And, and, and that's always got good reviews. They always come and say, you know, the students were able to do a great job in 4W this class if they were comfortable doing that. Okay? You look at some of the operation decisions in those uh, designs. So why, how do you lay out your, your site? How do you lay out your plant? How do you design your equipment in, a, in, a, in that plant? We'll create those flow sheets for doing that. So everything you learn in this course, you'll get to apply um, in the 4 and go into a bit more depth in an area that's of interest to you. Okay, so is that, that context helpful? I hope. Right, just that you see the bigger picture of where we're heading. Now that's here, this is, and then 2014, April, you're going to finish and then you're going to <coughs> leave and, and work elsewhere and you're going to get to use these same topics over again. So multiple times in your career, you'll get a chance to reuse these very, very important topics. Now, I would like to just um, talk a bit more about the structure of our, our project here before. So, in 3G, you, you set up flow sheets, and you solved those, you did a bit of economics, and that was, that was really good. But you never got to do some of the important engineering around deciding how is this process going to start up and shut down. Okay, so we've got these methanol reactors with feedback loops we're integrating the heat. We're reusing the exothermic heat of reaction to heat the entry stream coming into the reactor. But think a minute how you're going to start up that reactor. At steady state, it's all good and well to say, here's a heat exchanger at the start of my reactor that's preheating my stream. So if we take a look at the diagram, we've got this heat exchanger that's preheating my feed. Then I come into my, my tubular reactor here. Exothermic, this temperature leaving is higher than it's coming in. And so what you do is you feed this stream around and you use it to heat your feed. Okay, so your feed comes in cold, this comes in warm, and this is hot. But when you start up this reactor, <coughs> you've got no flow over here. So how are you going to go from cold to warm and get to the right reaction temperature? Okay. So we're going to talk about that in the coming two weeks, three weeks. But these are the sorts of topics we want you to start looking at on your flow sheets. So let's also consider and re recognize that each one of you in each group in the class has been given a section of the flow sheet. So you haven't been given the entire flow sheet. It would be too overwhelming. And it's also not realistic. Think of working in a company, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, bio, doesn't matter too much which area. And you're working in the company and you're going to conferences, you're interacting with colleagues, you're listening to your customers and you recognize there's a market opportunity to create a new product. What do you go and do next? You want to go create this product, there's a definite market for it. What happens next? So there's an economic evaluation of the market, and let's assume that that shows there's 
great demand for your products. So here's an opportunity for your company to create extra value. There's an opportunity for you to move forward in your career because if you're the guy that led this project, you're going to get great recognition in your company. So that's your motivation, but from your company's perspective, what motivation and what next steps have occurred? Designing the actual process. Okay, designing the actual process. Alex, I would start with a live scale experiment because you have to figure out which reaction pathway you're going to use. Okay, which reaction pathways you're going to use, do lab scale work, do proof of concept. So let's assume proof of concept is done and it shows we can do this. And we now go to designing the process. What is your competitor doing? Same thing. Absolutely. Your competitor is doing exactly the same thing as you. You're not, we're not the only smart engineers in the world, right? <coughs> Let's recognize that there are other people that are as good or better or worse than us. And other companies are doing similar work. How are they going to design their flow sheet versus how are we going to design our flow sheets and execute that project is going to establish who gets to sell and make their product available to the market first. Okay, so we're comfortable with first mover advantage. The person who gets to the market first and establishes their footprint and name over there can usually end up dominating that market. By and large, I mean, there's, there's exceptions always. But you do want to be there sooner rather than later. So the wrong way to go design a flow sheet is to say, well, you know what, we've established this great new product. Priya, why don't you go off and design the flow sheet and come back two years from now and we'll start to build it. Does that sound reasonable? No, absolutely not. So there's five, six engineers in the company and they're divided up into sections. Okay? So each group member or team in the company will design parts of the flow sheet. If you're in a petroleum company, it will be exactly like we're doing here in this course project. One group will do the methanol synthesis, another group will do the gasifier, other groups will do the carbon capture and sequestration, and they have to communicate with each other and talk about, here's my flow leaving coming into your area, you take care of it next. Okay? So every group in the company is responsible for a certain task or a, a section of the process. That's exactly why we're running the course project this way. It makes it also more manageable. There's no time for every one of you in the course to go be designing and planning the entire flow sheet. So we'll do it in, in sections. Okay, now we, we're really lucky because we've got a pre-solved Aspen flow sheet that tells us what all the flows are. So we don't have to interact between groups. So group A1 doesn't have to talk to group A2 to figure out their flows. We, we all know everyone's flow. So that's, that's solved. Now let's look at a group also. Within group A1, we've got five people. Right? Every one of your groups is four or five people. There's about 10 units within everyone's group. Okay, give or take. Heat exchangers, methanol synthesis uh, or reactors, heat exchangers, flash drums, absorbers, pack columns, pumps. Okay, so about 10 to 15 major units. So divide that up amongst your group members. It's, it's worked for about two or three, people, uh, three units per person. No tutorials the next week. No tutorials the week after. The next tutorial you have is only 11th of November. Okay, so lots of time for group members to work on their own sections. So here is where working together as a team is going to be critical which is why over the past two months, September and October, we've been forcing you to have these regular regular assignments in groups. So you're, you're collaborating and you're comfortable working with each other. Can you assume we're already still responsible for maintaining that log for the minutes? And yeah, you're still maintaining your logs, you're still rotating your group chairs and, um, and so forth. Right? So, so that's, that's going on here in, in the background. So, you, it's, it's manageable. My, my message, my main point here is that it's manageable. Right? It seems overwhelming if everyone is sitting back and they're all deciding to sit around the same Aspen flow sheet and work as a group of five people solving one problem at a time. That's not too helpful. But if you decouple that and say, okay, well, Jervis is going to go do this, Alex is going to do that, Marissa will do this, and then it's, it's, a, it's a whole lot manageable. So, so I, I want you to think of it in that, 
the context. I also just wanted to give you some additional motivation for what we're doing here at 4 um, I just wanted to share this with you. This was a, a job description for a petrochemical company um, that one of the students here in the class showed me. Um, now, this doesn't apply just for petrochem. It would apply for any job. You'd see this. Uh, I, I'd encourage you, like, obviously, some of you are not interested in petroleum. You, that's the last area you want to work in. Others, that this is great. But whatever your, your area of interest you'd like to work in, go look for four or five job descriptions right now and see what they're looking for. Read them and see what the responsibilities are. In this particular project, uh, job description, it's, it's interesting to say, read here, that your assignment will work as a junior engineer a designer or operations support engineer under the guidance of an experienced engineer. So you'll be working with someone. There is no way you're work, walking in and going to be responsible for designing control loops and relief systems and, and operations in the process with no oversight. So you're going to have a good mentor, or at least an experienced mentor. Now, you will be working in a team. You'll, you'll always see this teamwork, group work of some sort. It's every job description, so that's, we know that. Developing and evaluating alternate solutions to recommend the best business option. So there's the first four weeks of 4M over there summarized. Um, employing standard company design and process simulation tools, that's 3G, to describe the solution in sufficient detail to determine cost. Notice this, sufficient detail. So we don't need to go design the detailed tubular reactor to calculate the cost. Can we get ballpark figures, right? Are there crude rules of thumb we can look up to determine these things? We're not, this is not 3K, okay? We're also, at the beginning of a project, you're not going to that level of detail. That would be premature. Right? It's sort of like deciding the paint color that you want in your house before you build it. We're looking at the level of detail that's relevant to where we are in the project. We're at an early stage, so can we do just enough work, just sufficient detail to, to answer that question, to determine the cost? Verify operability, that's what we're going to look at the next three weeks from now. Uh, to demonstrate acceptable safety. So we're not over-engineering the safety, but we're designing safety levels that are appropriate to the unit operation. So the gasifier in that flow sheet that we're looking at and the methanol synthesis, these are high temperature exothermic reactions taking place. So there's an appropriate level of safety there that's very different from the level of safety around just the boiler feed heat exchanger. Um, consideration and communicate <coughs> the specifications to the engineering contract. So that's 2G, 3G, 4 and all of that communication that's up there over there. So that's meetings written reports, presentations. So, so that was interesting uh, from that perspective. And then finally here, operation support, um, the guidance from senior technical experts, and finally the person to troubleshoot operating problems. That's the last two weeks of this course. Okay, so, so many aspects of 4N just in this one job description, and you will see this a lot if you look at other, other job descriptions. So, so give that a go um, and, and prove to yourself that what we're learning here is is kind of useful. That means in the next few weeks when we're looking at these projects is I want you to come to the meetings with, with questions. So there's many unanswered questions that we all have right now. I put a few on that uh, handout that we saw the tutorial last week, so there's some of those handwritten questions. I'd like you to come to the meeting next week with some of these questions already solved. So some, some of these you are doable, others are not, others are too far ahead, but I want you to at least have thought about it. Other things I want you to do between now and the meetings are take a look at your chunk of the flow sheets. It's a reasonably small section. Also, it's from an established petrochemical flow sheet. So methanol synthesis, water gas shift reaction, these are things that we've been running and operating as engineers for 100 plus years. So you will find excellent information in all the standard encyclopedias and, and references. Perry's. Okay, so we all know or have heard of Perry's. There's other ones that are good for you to go look at if you haven't already, and that's the, the German Encyclopedia Koch established a long time ago, but it's a bit, got phenomenal detail on 
on most engineering uh, flow sheets. Terry's Owens reference is, is a good one. Uh, Arthur Woods has another book called Process Design and Engineering Practice. So that's got a lot of rules of thumbs on how, how do you size flash vessels quickly? How do you uh, size heat exchanges? Um, then the three other books that I have up here, these are standard books that you'll see in the library. So this one, there's a series of three volumes. I only have the first here, this is by Ludwig. So I'm writing these up just because some people are asking for where to go to. There's the big yellow book by Turton and about five other names in there. That's, that's on the course website. And then the one that's used in 3G, the CEDA, the CEDA textbook. So these last two have correlations for capital costs that you may not find in Dr. Woods' book. So some groups were asking questions along the lines of, how do I determine the cost of a packed column? I don't see this. Well, think of what a packed column is. A packed column is just a, a vessel, a vertically oriented vessel with packing in it. So we can cost it by two parts, the vessel and the packing. Okay, so it's doable. It's just you won't find a single correlation for it. Um, many of the other groups working on units that are not directly in those correlations, again, look at that unit. So gasifiers. People are like, well, where, where am I going to find the cost for a gasifier? Do the following. Go to Google Images and just look at what a gasifier is. Many people actually just have no idea what's going on physically in the gasifier. Look at the diagram for it, and you'll see Tons of images that get you ideas of dimensions and sizes of typical gasifiers, and you can see what the components are. When you look at those components, and can we break it down into smaller correlations? Um, so whenever you get this challenge of where do I get the sizing of it, let's look at it and break it down into smaller pieces. And there's, you can then cost it as components, which then add up to the total unit. And then just a few other things before uh, Matt comes and talks. Um, I will have, um, I'm kind of debating on just a bit of a grade change for the, for the projects, meetings. So right now it's 25% for the meetings and 75 for the written report. I was thinking because there's, there's a bit of uh, uncertainty here and I wanted the meetings, it's to be far more relaxed and not, it doesn't need to be as great, stressful as people are making it. So you consider dropping that down to 15% for the meetings and 85 for the written projects. Is that something that seems to work? Okay, so agreements in general. So 15% for the meetings. And then that grading of 15% is primarily on the agenda and the minutes that you write up, as well as on the, on the level and quality of questions you come with. Right? So we're not here to discuss basic questions. We're here to answer and, and work on challenging questions. So 15% then there's a lot lower um, threshold and, and far, far less stressful and is more in line with the intention that I want from these meetings. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I will, in the meeting, I will get your group's verbal approval for that change. If you're comfortable with that change, if you're not, if you want to stick to the original grading, that's okay. But every group you get to choose, either you want this meeting to be 25 or 50 and I'll ask you to start the meeting. Okay. That way every group gets, you know, not, not everyone's tied in, so you can make that decision over the weekend. Um, and then just a final question, a uh, final point is when you're looking at your flow sheets, there's going to be units on there that you, you see a block, right? and you see a block that says compressor. Now, compressor is like pump or like heat exchange. In any one of these units, there's not one type of these things, right? When it comes to pumps, for example, we're comfortable that there's axial positive displacement, diaphragm pumps, and so forth. With the compressors, it's the same, same idea. Many different technologies that drive that compressor and how it operates. In order for the meeting to be productive and useful for us, you really must take a look at the details 
or at least a, a, a high level understanding of what's going on in that unit. So a compressor should, it's a change in the pressure of the inlet gas to the outlet gas, but how is it doing? How many stages are required? Why do we have stages? Why do we have interstage cooling? Read up on the units and, fit and learn what are the safety issues related to that unit. What are the operational issues related to that unit? Okay, so how are those units typically operated and what are the safety problems with it? But we're going to be asking questions around that. How do you, because that's going to lead into your next question, how do you control that unit? Where do you put your control loops? Do you notice that Aspen and um, Dr. Adams' hand up have no control loops at all? And so when we say the pressure here is 54 bar, well, it, how is it getting there? What's controlling it? What are we manipulating? Okay. And then one final point just to end off related to control is I want you to think of the following. Um, when we look at control, there's two ways of considering control on the flow sheet. So let's maybe take a look at this last one, product pool. Product pool is, think of your fridge at home. Okay. So you're here. And if you've got a regular appetite, you're eating three meals a day. Okay, so you're going to your fridge and you're taking food out. Okay, so at some point, your fridge's level is going to run low. You're going to run out of milk, you're going to run out of butter, you're going to run out of stuff in your fridge. Okay? So you need to go fill that level back up again. So you go and there's that valve, you open it, i.e. open your wallet, go to the grocery store and you fill up this level again. Okay? So you're here pulling food on a continual basis, and you're filling up the fridge. So you're going to the grocery store and depleting their product. The grocery store's level is dropping down. The grocery store has to go back here and open their valve and fill up their grocery store. Then they have to go back here to their original supplier. Okay? So this is a pull chain. So you're here, and other consumers at the same pulling, and the control strategy is to open at the entry point based on the level of okay. here. So that's pull strategy. Push strategy is we've got feed coming in at a given flow rate. So that flow rate is changing up and down, whatever the we have you you know, push it our process. And it's, it's usually try to keep constant, but it will it will fluctuate. We'll fill up this level and that level can get too high we need to start opening that valve. If that level gets too low, we need to back off on that valve opening. Now that gets pushed down to the next unit. So it's up to the next unit to control its, itself. Okay, and so forth. And then at the end, we'll get a final flow rate after all of these levels interact. So what is our flow sheet that we're dealing with? Is it a push or is it a pull? And when you're designing your unit, you may be here in the middle. Are you receiving as a push or are you supplying as a pull? Okay, so think about that and we'll talk about that in the meetings as well. Okay. So next I'd like to introduce Matt. Matt was a student here in Tulane last year. He's now, now working out in the oil sands and get to tell us a little bit about it. Um, appreciate your time for coming in to do that. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So hi guys. As Kevin said.